Good morning. I'm so excited that you're here today. We've got a good group of people here. And today is going to be a good day. Uh, we are excited about what God's doing in our church. And uh, we pray that you're blessed by our services this morning. My name is Roger Dawson. I am the associate and youth pastor here at Main Simple Baptist Church. And it's my privilege to fill in this morning for our pastor, Brother Roger, as he's away on vacation. And uh, it's been a little while since I filled in the pulpit, and I'm excited to be here today. I want to remind all of our congregation that tonight we are having our Thanksgiving Potluck Fellowship, and we want everybody to come and be a part of that. It's going to be a great time together. And uh, we're asking everyone to bring uh, two different items that they can share with their family and another family. So if you would be mindful of that and help us out, that would make today even better. One of the ushers was talking with me just a few moments ago, and they said, you know, Brother Roger D., we might actually have more people tonight, as, many, as much as Baptists love food. So uh, we'll, we'll hope for that today anyway. But no, I am excited that you're here this morning. Uh, this is a privilege that I don't take lightly. Um, filling in, it's always a, a blessed opportunity. It is one that I approach with great fear and trembling. And though I'll tell people that I get nervous every time I step into the pulpit, they say, you don't show it at all, but it's the truth. I do get very nervous. And part of my nervousness comes from this idea of what is it that God wants me to share? What does God want me to preach on? What should my sermon be about? And I'll go through and I'll debate that more than just about anything else. That's the hardest part for me is finding out what it is that God wants me to share with the congregation. It reminded me of a story uh, because as I, I, I listen to God and try to find out what it is that He wants me to share, I try to craft my sermon around that topic. And it reminded me of a sermon that, I, or excuse me, a story I'd heard about a uh, retired pastor who decided one day that he was going to um, surprise his bride and he was going to uh, clean out their closet and uh, just kind of make extra room for her for anything that she needed. As he's going through the closet, um, he's sorting through different things. He comes across an old shoebox. And when he opens the shoebox, he's kind of puzzled by what he finds inside. Inside this shoebox are three rotten eggs and 99 $1 bills. He's curious about this. What in the world are these eggs, these rotten eggs, doing in the shoebox with this money? And so when his wife gets home that day, he asks her and says, Honey, tell me about this shoebox. What is this about? And she was kind of ashamed to spill the beans about what the box really was about. She said, well, honey, um, every time that you preach uh, a bad sermon, I would take and I would put an egg in the shoebox. <laughs> and so he started thinking for a moment, well, there's only three eggs here. That's not that bad. And he said, well, I guess there were only three sermons that were bad. I did pretty good. And she said, well, technically, whenever the box was filled with 12 eggs, I would go to the next door neighbor and I would sell them for a dollar. <laughs> So, yeah, it wasn't quite as good as what he had thought, but that's my fear, is just bringing God's Word and bringing it in such a way that it honors Him and honors uh, His Word, but I'm excited to have that opportunity to, to fill in today. Um, as I was praying and asking God which direction uh, that we should go, one of the things that He made clear to me is this idea that... Um, what is it we want as pastors? Nobody ever prays for half-hearted followers of Christ. Do you know what I'm saying? No pastor makes it his life goal or his church's goal to have half-hearted followers of Jesus. That is not the goal of any pastor that I've ever met. Yes, we want new believers, but we want them to be fully committed. In fact, that's kind of the, the hope that all of us have is that we would be completely committed followers of Jesus Christ, that we want our church members, our congregation to be passionate about the Lord and follow Him in every area of their lives. But that's a difficult thing because life is hard. You know, there was a church in the book of Revelation that was half-hearted in their commitment to follow Christ. It was the church of Laodicea. If you remember, Jesus says about them, you're neither uh, hot nor cold, you're lukewarm. Because you're lukewarm, I'm going to throw you up out of my mouth. 
And, and just that idea, nobody wants that. We want fully committed followers of Jesus Christ, completely committed followers of Jesus Christ. As I share that, um, I was praying and asking God what direction we should go, and, uh, and He did give me uh, an answer. And I hope that it blesses you this morning. As we get into it, I want to say um, things don't always work out just the way that you think that they are. I heard the story about a, a young farm boy who was asked by his dad to help deliver some uh, a trailer load of, of corn. It seems that this farm boy accidentally overturned his wagon load of corn, and the farmer who lived nearby heard the noise and all the commotion. Hey, Willis, the farmer yelled, forget your troubles, come on in with us, and then I'll help you get the wagon up. That's mighty nice of you, Willis answered, but I don't think Pa would like me to do that. Oh, come on, the farmer insisted. Well, okay, the boy finally agreed, and he added, but Paul's not going to be happy. He won't like it. After a hearty dinner, Willis thanked his host. I feel a lot better now, but I know Paul's going to be really upset. The farmer said, don't be foolish. By the way, where is your father? Where is your Paul? And the young boy replied, he's under the wagon. <laughs> You know, things don't always work out just the way that they seem. Um, there's always more going on behind the scenes than you would ever recognize. And we, as believers, we've got to be wise. We've got to have our eyes open to be focused on the things that matter most to be able to understand. Um, whenever I was a young boy, I remember our family, we would take different trips uh, to different places. Uh, I know that Dallas has six flags over Texas. And We've taken the youth group there a couple of times, and maybe you've been there yourself. Um, I, as a child, never had the opportunity to go to Six Flags over Texas. But in Houston, we had a Six Flags theme park. Many of you are familiar with it. Maybe you've even been there. It's Astral World. Anybody ever been to Astral World? Yeah, Astral World was a great place, much like uh, Six Flags over Texas. Lots of fun. I remember a lot of childhood memories on the roller coaster rides. There was the Looping Starship, the Viper, uh, there was a roller coaster called Accelerate. All these different rides, they were a lot of fun and our family would go. But I remember that my parents would dread uh, a couple of places in the park. There was one place that was, uh, it was kind of a, a middle-aged theme. It was kind of uh, Excalibur and the Knights of the Round Table. That was kind of the theme of that part of the park. And I remember as a kid walking into that area that all of a sudden, as I'm walking through this area, parents are close at hand, I hear all of this music, and I turn to see what the music and the commotion is about, and I see all of these bright lights, all of these whistles and bells, and all these things going on, lots of kids gathered around, and as I get a little bit closer to look and see what's going on, I notice there's these huge, huge, giant-sized stuffed animals and different things that are hung from the ceiling at all of these prize booths. How many of you know what I'm talking about? See, there's an example of it right there. That just kind of captivated my attention as a kid. I was like blown away. And of course, as a young kid, I looked to dad and I say, dad, can we go do this? And he's like, no, that's just a waste of time. But dad, please, it's a really cool prize. I'd love to win that. Can you win that for me? And of course, my dad would say, no, don't worry about this. This is just a waste of money. He knew a couple of things more than I did at that moment. But as I got a little older and I was able to venture away from my parents, I took the opportunity to try to win some of those prizes. Uh, I don't know if you remember a lot of the games, but often at these games, what you'll have is you'll have a carny that's there who's running that game, or game operator, and they've got a microphone that's uh, connected either to their earpiece and mouth, or they've got a microphone they're actually talking to you. And I don't know if you've ever been walking through the park with your kids, but what do they do on that microphone? They start trying to call and drag a, a crowd over, and a lot of times if nobody's around and they see parents, they try to make them feel guilt, guilty and heckle and saying, oh, you don't want to win that for your kid? You don't have what it takes? Come on, you can do this. What, is your kid not good enough for you to win that prize? In the back of their mind, I know those carnies, they realize this truth, that most people that come up to them, they don't have what it takes. 
You might ask, well, what do you mean, Roger D? Because aren't those games all created equal? Isn't it a fair opportunity for everybody to win? <laughs> and I want to share with you, there's a little bit of truth in that, but you got to understand the dynamics of carnival games. I just got a couple of them up on the screen that I want to remind you about. I don't know if you've seen the basket toss where they have the basket there and you've got the ball, baseballs or softballs and you got to toss it into the back basket. Often what happens in this case is you'll get it into the basket but it immediately bounces out. What's funny though is the carnival operators, you ask them, hey, can you show me how this is done? And they can do it almost every single time. And so they make it look so simple. Um, there's other games that they have as well. The next one is the, the balloon dart game, uh, where you take and you try to throw the darts at the balloons, and if you pop the balloon, you get a prize for that. Um, then you have the hoop shoot with the basketball goals. You may not realize this, but those games, they're designed in such a way where they're actually rigged against you. For instance, the basketball game, I don't know if you know this, it's not a regular basketball hoop, it's actually an oval instead of a circle so that you have even less of a chance for the ball to go in. Some of you are thinking, that's why I've lost every time! <laughs> See, I knew it was rigged! Well, I'm happy to tell you, you have just reason. And then, for instance, with the ring toss, I know many of you probably played the ring toss. Did you know that they make those rings just as small as they can so that they barely fit over the bottom? The chances of you winning at any of those games is so slim because the game is rigged against you. And for most people that go up to it, this truth is certainly characteristic. And you don't have what it takes. You don't have what it takes because the game is rigged against you. That game that I just showed you a moment ago with the basket and the baseballs or softballs, there was a young man who his kid had made him feel a little, little guilty and he decided he was going to try to win this prize for him. He goes up and he tries to win the prize, uh, but before he does, the carnival operator even gives him a chance to try to play and show him how easy it is. So he takes the ball, he tosses it into the basket, and almost effortlessly, he makes it into the basket and it stays. Now he says, okay, but now it's for the money, and this is the real deal, this is for the prize, here it is. So he lays out the money, and he takes the balls, but this time things are different. Things don't go just the way that he had experienced a moment ago. He tosses the ball in, and it bounces out, almost with force, almost like it was kicked out. So he does it again. The third try, he still misses. He's scratching his head, he doesn't understand what's going on. I'm sad to stand here before you today that this person kept playing that game until he spent his entire life savings. $2,600 he spent trying to win this, and every single time he failed. You see, the way that they make that possible for you to make it in is they leave one ball in the basket. When you throw the ball into the basket and that other ball's there, it keeps it from bouncing against the back of all that force and popping out. The game is rigged against you. <laughs> what you need to understand is this fact about carnival games. Carnival games are not meant to be won. Sure. Carnival games were never designed for you to win. They know that the house uh, has all of the advantages, that it's stacked <laughs> against you. Well, it reminded me of this scripture in 1 Corinthians 9 because as I'm preparing and praying and asking God, God, what direction would you have us to go this morning? His answer to me was, Roger, I want fully committed followers of Christ. I want people who are all in when it comes to the call of Christ. I want people who are, are going to sell out everything for my cause. That they're not going to be half-hearted, but they'll be all in. You see, whenever you play those carnival games, you need to understand one very important truth. When a dad goes up there or a kid goes up there, they're not playing the game just to play the game. Why are they playing the game? They're playing to win, and win especially the prize that's advertised. They're playing to win the prize. I don't know if you know this, but Scripture speaks about a prize that you and I are, are to pursue. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. If you have your Bible, go ahead and turn there. And as you're turning there, I'm going to pray and ask God to direct the rest of our time together. But I want you to understand there's a very serious call for you and I to reflect and examine our lives 
to make sure that we're all in for Christ. And that the things that matter most are the things that we're pursuing. We're not forgetting about the stuff that's most important. So if you would, I'm going to pray and ask God to direct the rest of our time as you're turning to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Father, thank you for this morning and the opportunity that we have to uh, open your word together. I pray, God, that you would speak truth to our hearts. Father, that the Holy Spirit would speak into us and reveal, God, those areas of our life, maybe that we've uh, turned into a game or those areas of our life that we've not taken you serious enough. But God, that we would look at ways that we can truly follow hard after you and be fully committed followers, completely committed followers of you. God, would you take your word and let's speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 and 25 read as such. Do you not know that in a race all of the runners run, but only one of the runners gets the prize? The Apostle Paul encourages and reminds them, if you think about the Olympics and the sporting games, there's only one first place winner, and he is the one that gets the prize. Unless there's a weird fluke and it's a tie, and today they'll make exception for that. But even back then, I'm sure they would do some sort of tiebreaker, but there would only be one who gets the prize. He reminds the church and us, run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games, they go into strict training. Why do they do it? They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Amen. You see, the Apostle Paul was using an analogy from that day, looking at the Olympic Games that were taking place, the sporting events, and he said, hey, there's a perfect illustration right here. All of the runners, all of the athletes that compete in these games, why do they do it? They do it because they want to win first place. They want to win a prize. What was the victor's crown? What was their prize that they got awarded? Well, it was a wreath made out of leaves, and that would be set upon their head. But what Paul knew, and what you and I know also, is that that crown would one day what? Wither away. It would fade away. It would fall apart, disintegrate, and it would be no more. And he says, look at their commitment. Look at their willingness to do what they're doing. And they're only doing that for a crown that's going to fade away. But for believers in Jesus Christ... What are you willing to do, not for a crown that's going to pass away, but one that's going to last forever? And that's where Paul says, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. You see, Paul is using this analogy to try to explain to the believers, hey, if Olympic athletes are, are willing to discipline their bodies and go through all of these hardships just to win a temporary prize, how much more should you and I who recognize what's going on in this world, be even more committed to pursue after Christ and to run the race that's marked out for us Amen. because we will get a prize that will last forever. Praise the Lord. You see, from that example, there's a couple of things that stand out that you and I, we need to look at, we need to dive into. Um, if you have your Bible, turn over to Hebrews chapter 12 because you're going to see a similar analogy that the writer of the book of Hebrews shares with the church. And as you're turning there, let me just explain a little bit about the book of Hebrews so you have this understanding. Scholars believe that the book of Hebrews was written after 68 AD, and between 68 AD and 95 AD. That's pretty late when it comes to Christian writings, but they have narrowed it down probably to between 68 AD and 69 AD is when this was written. Now, I say that because there should be some things that um, you're aware of in that moment. There was a lot that happened between 33 AD or thereabouts when Jesus died on the cross to 65 or 68 AD. What events took place in that time? Well, James, who was the brother of John, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, James was killed in 44 AD. If you remember Stephen, one of the early deacons, he was killed. He was martyred for his faith. James, the brother of Jesus, was even killed. And three other major people in the church, they were murdered for their faith. Paul, Peter, and Jude. All of them were killed before 68 AD or by 68. So these leaders in the church, as believers, are watching what God's doing. 
and they're seeing the persecution that the church is enduring, they're having all these different thoughts of this race is hard. How am I going to run this race? In fact, I'm contemplating even giving up. Is this race worth it? That's the question that was running through their minds. And what you see in the book of Hebrews is that the writer had two primary purposes for his writing. Number one, to encourage Christians to endure the hardships and to warn them not to abandon their faith. Don't give up. Understand, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. Amen. If you sprint and you use up everything you have, you'll collapse just after the start, not far into it. The writer of the book of Hebrews realizes this. So let's dive into this here in just a moment. But as we do, I want you to keep this question in your mind. We've got three questions I want us to look at. And the first one is this, and it relates to uh, what is the prize? What is the believer's prize? Because you're going to see that same thing here of the race and what it is that they're to be looking at. And the writer of the book of Hebrews identifies the prize. And I want you to see this because it makes all of the difference. You remember what I said about the carnival games? Why do they compete? Why do they do the games? They don't do it just to win. They do it to win the prize. If you don't understand what the prize is, you're going to lose your motivation and your desire to compete, to follow, to run. So you have to understand what the prize is. Hebrews chapter 12 makes that clear. So let's jump into Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. The writer of the book of Hebrews says this, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of of our faith. Amen. I don't know if you realize this, but there is a ton of stuff in just these two verses. And we didn't even read the full two verses. There's only half of verse two that we got into. But I stopped there because I want to focus on just this point. The writer of the book of Hebrews gives some very clear instructions to those, those believers. Since we're surrounded by a cloud of witnesses, what does that mean? Well, he's just gotten out of Hebrews chapter 11 where he goes through and he talks about all of the heroes of faith. And he's describing this analogy of them being spectators in a stands watching the races unfold. He says, since we're surrounded by such great company, such awesome testimonies of faithfulness, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let's not go up to the starting gate with our feet all bound. There's a picture that I'd show you of uh, somebody... You don't want to be handicapped whenever it comes to starting the race. Debbie, I know it's ahead a little bit, but <laughs> you don't want to go up to the races with your feet all bound because there's a great chance that you might get tripped up. You know, it's for freedom that Christ came to set us free. Amen. And so we shouldn't go up to the starting line with our feet bound and our shoulders packed down with all of these different weights. No, let us run as if we are going to win the prize. Let us run with great commitment. Amen. Because there's a lot on the line. So he goes on and he says, let us throw off all the stuff that's going to slow us down and make us ineffective in our racing. And let us run with perseverance the race that's marked for us. Amen. And then in verse 2 he says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Why did I stop right there? Because I want us to focus in on that phrase. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus. You remember just a moment ago, as I was talking about the carnival games, as a kid, what was it that attracted my attention to the games? Yeah, first it was the music, then it was the lights, and I saw all this commotion. But what captivated me more than anything else was the gigantic prize that was there. It's like, oh, that's awesome. i got to have that. And that's probably a $2 prize. Do you know that? <laughs> And I just had to have that. And here, the prize is so much more. What is the prize? I, mean, 
happy to tell you that Jesus is the prize. He's the one that we look to. And you might be confused by that statement. Why would Jesus be the prize? I thought we got a crown in heaven. Well, that may be true, but Jesus, more than anything else, is the prize. Yes, the believer who endures, the believer who is faithful. Yes, the believer will get heaven and all those rewards and all those things. But the best thing about heaven is not those things. The best thing about heaven is the person of Jesus. You gotta hear that. Let me just share just a few verses with you about who Jesus is. In Acts chapter 3, verse 15, Peter's describing what God's done, and he says, You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead, and we are witnesses of this fact. The writer of Hebrews in chapter 1, verse 3 says that the Son, Jesus, is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature, Amen. upholding all things by his powerful word. And after he had provided purifications for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty of God. You see, Jesus is the prize. It reminds me of what happened on the hill of transfiguration, the Mount of Transfiguration, and Jesus let his glory shine. The disciples were enamored by it. You see, when we catch a clear glimpse of who Jesus is, it ruins us for anything. Why? Why? Because he is that majestic, that awesome, that glorious, and most of all, that amazing. If we don't know that and believe that, then we've missed out on who Jesus is. And we need to stand here today and say, God, give me a fresh glimpse of who Jesus is. Because Jesus is the reason we should run with everything that we are. Amen. Jesus is the reason that we should be fully, completely committed followers of Christ. Amen. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44, one of my favorite verses of Scripture. Jesus describes the kingdom of heaven. And here's what he says. He says that the, the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that was hidden in a field. When a man found it, he hid it again. And then in his joy, he went and sold everything that he had to buy that field. Why? Because he knew that the treasure that he found was far greater than anything that he could own. Amen. And so when he found this treasure, he went and sold everything he had, and he rejoiced to do so because he knew what he was getting. What I want you to understand is that Jesus is not talking about the treasures of jewels and gold and precious metals or things in heaven. That's not what Jesus is talking about. The treasure of heaven is Jesus himself. Amen. Amen. When the rich young ruler came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what do I lack to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you know the commandments. What have you done? What are they say? Well, honor your father and mother. Don't steal. Don't kill. Don't cheat. Don't lie. All those things that I've done since I was a youth. I've never done any of those things. I've observed those laws. And he said, one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor. And then come follow me. Why did Jesus say that? Come follow me. Because Jesus was the treasure. Amen. Jesus is the treasure. Amen. Listen, when we have this truth in mind, it makes Romans chapter 12, verse 1 completely understandable. If you'll go to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I've got it on the screen. It says this, Paul writing, he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. What is the Apostle Paul saying? He's saying, hey, wake up to this truth. What is the prize? The prize is Jesus. Don't just offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Yeah, that's well and good. But if you just do that just to do it, you're going to get burned out. You're going to get unmotivated. And you're going to wear out. But when you do this in view of God's mercy and who Christ is, then it makes all the difference in the world. Amen. Jesus is the prize. Amen. And you and I, we need to understand that in this race, the stakes are high. Consider what is at stake. It is not just your eternity, but the eternity of those people that are around you. Wake up to this truth right here. That you and I, we're not in some game. This is not just a game for us. 
This is more than that. There's so much more at stake. <laughs> I don't know how many of you are familiar with uh, the modern day um, missionary who is also a martyr. His name is Jim Elliott. Um, you may be familiar with his wife, Elizabeth Elliott. Um, they are some amazing people. I was talking with Jackie this week as I was reading through some of their stuff and I was just blown away as you read through the way they talk with one another. People don't talk that way today. <laughs> where they're so passionate, sold out for Christ, where they're willing to lay everything down on the line, even their own very lives. Jim Elliott was a missionary to uh, the Ecuadorian people and some Native American tribes that were there. Um, he went there hoping to share the gospel, and the question was asked, well, Jim, what if you and your peers, what if you lose your life? And one of the things he said was that God wants to use my blood, his glory, and that advances his name, then so be it. By my life or by my death, if he is glorified, then may it be so. He shared these words, and I want you to just kind of soak in the weight of these words here from Jamalia. It says this, We are so utterly ordinary, so commonplace, while we profess to know a power that the 20th century does not reckon with. <coughs> But we are harmless, and therefore we are unharmed. We are spiritual pacifists, non-militants, conscientious objectors, ob objectors in this battle to the death with principalities and powers in high places. What is he saying right there? That, hey, there's a war that's going on, and the believers in the churches today are just sitting back saying, you know what? If we can just live at peace with God and not cause a scene or a ruckus, then everything will be good. And he says this, that the reason that Satan's not attacking you is because you're not worth attacking. He doesn't have to. You're not in the game. And that's a sad indictment on the church because so many of us think this is just a game. It's one. Jim Elliott continues and he says this. He says, meekness must be had for contact with men. Yes, when it comes to sharing the love of Christ, we need to be meek. As we go to them and share the, cruise, the, the, the truth of the cross, but brass, outspoken boldness is required to take part in the camaraderie of the cross. We are sideliners, coaching and criticizing the real wrestlers while we're content to sit by and leave the enemies of God in challenge. The world cannot hate us. We're too much like its own. Listen to what he says. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. Oh, that God would make us dangerous. So guys, listen, when it comes to this truth about the race that's marked out for us, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's difficult. But don't step up to the line with your feet all wrapped up with all of these different things. He says, throw off the sin that so easily entangles and all the other stuff that hinders you from running well. Throw it off. Well, my question then is this. How do we throw off sin? That was the question that just kind of racked my brain. How do we throw off sin? I mean, obviously, yeah, maybe we can stop doing certain sins, but there's more to it than that because doesn't temptation haunt us? Doesn't it follow us everywhere we go? I mean, temptation is thick. Amen. And it's so hard to completely throw it off. Listen, listen. It's easy to get distracted by those things. I heard the story of a, a, an Irish uh, athlete who was running some races in college. His name was Agnes Melvin. I've got a picture here that you can see. It's hard to tell what it is in this scene, but uh, let me just kind of read his testimony. Angus Melvin was sprinting toward victory at a university's meet in Athlone, Ireland, when he was stopped in his tracks by a freak accident. You see, right beside where he was running, there was a pole vault competition that was about to go on, and the, the participants were practicing. Well, the practice crossbar from the nearby pole vault it catapulted onto the track just as Melvin and his fellow runners were sprinting by. Unbelievably, the elastic hit him in the face, and he tried to throw it off, but when he did, it fell to the ground and wrapped around his ankles, and that's what you see there. You see, where he was once in first place, ready to get the prize, 
something all of a sudden entangled him, sabotaged his victory. You see, you never know what things are going to beset us. We need to be vigilant. We need to have our eyes open. We need to deal with the sin that so easily entangles us. How do we do that? Listen, I know that there are habits, there are thoughts, there are things that you wrestle with on a daily basis. How do you do that? How do you throw those sins off? Well, there's two things. Number one, understand this, that the sin that you fight against is deeper than just outward influences. The Bible says that the heart is deceitful above all things. Where does the battle for sin take place? It happens in our heart and in our minds. Understand that, that our heart, whenever we get involved in sin, that it's what's in our heart that comes out. Jesus said the person who lusts after a woman in his heart has already done what? Committed adultery. The person who has hate in his heart toward a brother, what has he done in his heart? He's committed murder. You see, those things come out of the heart. So how do we deal with that sin? Number one, understand this, that you and I, we are creatures of habit. Whenever I was a kid, there was some woods that I used to walk. And in those woods, you would find different paths that you could walk. Whether they were made by people or animals, the paths were there. And they were well-worn paths. You and I, in our daily practices, in our temptations with sin, in our struggles, and even in our failures, here's what happens. Oftentimes, we will walk those paths. And we realize that God doesn't want us to go down this path, and we need to stop. How do we do that? We have to make a new paths. Let me ask you a question. How easy is it to make a new path? Is it easy? No, because no, you have to fight thorns and bristles and weeds and trees and all of these different things. And it's not an easy process. But I'm happy to tell you that you don't have to do this alone. You have brothers and sisters in this fight to help you. They can help lead you in that way to make new paths. The amazing thing is that the more you follow God, the easier it becomes to have victory over those sins. Amen. Listen, um, for time's sake, let me jump ahead and ask this question because I know life gets hard and I know that temptation causes us to get heavy hearted and weighed down. And oftentimes in the middle of that, we get so frustrated and it's easy to give up. What I would tell you this morning is don't forget what the prize is. Throw off the stuff that entangles you and persevere. Persevere. Amen. Listen, uh, my question would be this, this third thought. How should Christians persevere? Hebrews chapter 12, the, the writer <coughs> continues in verses 3 and 4 and tells us how. He says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Verse 5, it continues. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father addresses his son? It says, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone that he accepts as his son. Yesterday I was talking to my son, and he asked me, he said, uh, Dad, what are you going to be talking about tomorrow when you preach? And I told him Hebrews chapter 12. And he says, well, what part are you going to be focusing on? And he said one thing. I said, no, I'm not focusing on that. And then he said another. He said, are you talking about discipline? And during discipline, I said, yeah. And he said, I love how the writer says, no discipline is pleasant when the person is going through. He says, it's not like the writer needed to remind us of that truth. We knew discipline is not pleasant already. I'm sure that as he said that, he was recalling all of the spankings and whoopings that he had as a child. But uh, he says, that should be good, Dad. I'm excited for you. Because what you need to understand is that the writer's talking about how we should persevere. When things get hard, understand this. That you and I should do two things. Number one, we should consider Christ, who already went through things far greater than you and I will ever go through in life. And that we should consider the hardships that he went through. Why? Because knowing that he endured them and successfully made it through, and that the Spirit of Christ lives in us, the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, it works in us, it will help us. He will help us to endure. Secondly, 
secondly, when things get hard, remember, the reason that God allows us to go through those things is that when that happens, it's because God loves you. Amen. You see, God is trying to work and develop something inside of you much greater and much more valuable than you could ever see. You can't see it right now because you're in the thick of it, but when you make it through, you're going to see an amazing blessing on the other side. So this morning, as we get ready to close, I want to remind you and ask you, where are you at in this walk with Christ? Where are you at in this race? Is Jesus your great treasure? And if He's not, let's fall on our knees and ask Him, God, give me a fresh vision of who you are. Show me your son. Show me your glory. Now I have this treasure. Amen. Let us throw off the sin that hinders, the things that entangle us. Let us run with perseverance. The most Amen. I don't know what God's put on your heart this morning, but we're going to give you an opportunity to respond. I'd ask you right there where you are if you'd stand up and join me as we get ready to have an invitation. Whatever God's doing in your heart, we want you to be faithful to respond. I'm going to have a word of prayer. When I say amen, you respond as the band comes. Father, we come before you today and just ask that you have your way in your people. God, you uh, have obviously put some things in front of us today, some truths that we need to look at, where we are in relation to you. God, I thank you for those followers who are faithful in their commitment. But God, some of us were worn out, we're tired. We don't know how we're going to take our next step. God, I pray that we remember the prize. God, that we throw off anything that's weighing us down. We would consider what Christ has done. And that, God, you're trying to work something in us. And that would give us hope to take those next steps. God, let us run. Let us run passionately. Father, there's some that have never trusted you. They've never accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. I pray, God, this morning will be the day that they do that. That they would come down to this altar, meet me, and us some bended name, God, that we might pray and trust Christ. Father, whether there's somebody that's here today that wants to get on with our fellowship, God, we ask that you would move in the Father, whatever it is you need to do, we ask you to do it in Jesus' name.